Fisher from the AOE. Hi. Can folks hear me? Yes, we can. My really? apologies. My multiple unmute buttons are always always my undoing. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. For the Hi. record, uh, Ted Fisher from the Vermont Agency of Education and the agency's director of communications and legislative affairs. I also lead the agency's COVID-19 response team. And I'm very glad to be with you on a snowy Friday afternoon in spring. So raining here. Um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to dive right into my update. It's a little bit light today, but I'm um, happy to go ahead and uh, give that update if that works for you, Madam Chair. Okay, great. And I also just want to ha hold that one question about the um, wellness group at the end. Absolutely. I can, I can answer that now. Um, and I did, I did exchange some emails with Representative James yesterday afternoon. I still need to um, connect with Secretary French about this. Um, we actually uh, submitted a legislative report yesterday afternoon uh, in regards to ongoing work on comprehensive health education and sexual health education as part of these conversations over the past couple of sessions with uh, mostly with House Human Services. We did realize that this um, uh, wellness council has been um, in abeyance for, for some time and we are interested in getting it reinvigorated but I need to check in with specifically, uh, specifically with regard to the question of adding this, this group. And I think maybe we can give an update on um, next week. I don't wanna speak for the secretary without checking in with him, but maybe we can check in and give you a little bit more of an update about what we're looking at there. Okay, um, I would imagine that's probably gonna go into the draft on Tuesday. So if you don't want it, we're gonna need to yeah. know Tuesday. But Monday would be- In this that. area. Okay, yeah, we, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to connect with him about this on Monday. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, um, I, I recommend folks uh, take a look at the legislative report that we just submitted. Um, it does detail the work specifically done around sexual health education um, over the past two years, working with the health department and a range of stakeholders. I don't want to foreshadow because, like I said, we're still working on it internally, but um, we see some synergistic opportunities here um, as well uh, for some of the work we've done specifically with regard to this aspect of health education but also um, there are plenty of other, um, including child nutrition areas of wellness that are, that are very important. So um, i sorry to not have more of an update, uh, um, but we're, we'll, we should be able to uh, give you some, some update uh, fairly soon and speak specifically to the question of the membership. Great. So, all right, and, and uh, with that- also your section. Ahead, um, I know Representative James was doing it, but Representative Austin, that's your section of the bill too, so. Please stay connected, okay? Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Okay, awesome. Uh, again, for the record, Ted Fisher from Mana Agency of Education. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide a weekly situation report on the pandemic as it impacts education in Vermont. This is a similar briefing to one that Secretary French provides on a weekly basis to Vermont superintendents. After a short oral briefing, I'll do my best to answer questions related to AOE's response and recovery efforts. If there's something I cannot answer, we'll do our best to follow up post-briefing or provide more information at our next status update. Um, and I know you are also scheduled to hear um, from Secretary, uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher about recovery um, today. Unfortunately, uh, with the long floor time, her, her calendar, she wasn't able to move things around this afternoon. So um, we're working to get her scheduled in next week to uh, speak to you about recovery. So I, I don't have any specific status updates um, I, can, uh, I can provide today on that, but I do um, I do know she's looking forward to speaking with you, and I know I know there is interest from folks on that. So, uh, okay. apologies that we can't get that in today. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'll just dive into the COVID nineteen context. Um, we're we're seeing case counts still at a plateau. We're seeing a seven day average of around one hundred cases a day. Um, there is a there is a downward trend, sort of a, a less steep downward trend than when we saw earlier um, earlier in the spring. Um, we're still seeing um, pretty significant activity in Chitton, Orleans, and Rutland counties. Um, and Vermont, generally speaking, is still doing a lot of testing. Um, we're one of the we're one of the top performers in states on a per capita basis. Um, and we're seeing a really um, at this point seeing a really low test positivity rate, which is that really important number. It's currently 1.8 percent, and it's one of the lowest in the country's country. And we're doing very well by comparison to some of our other New England states um, there. New Hampshire is 5.7%, New York is 3.1%, Connecticut 3.6%, Maine is 27 and Massachusetts is 24 
Um, so that's good news in terms of the general community spread. Um, we are seeing some case counts in the 20 to 29 age group declining a bit in the last seven days, um, but it's still disproportionately high to other age groups. And the trend, as I've mentioned over a couple of weeks, um, the trend uh, continues to drop as um, older Vermonters uh, continue to be vaccinated. Um, we just still continue to see the average um, average age of cases uh, decline. We're also still continuing to see a, a pretty high rate of daily cases in schools with 15 to 20 new reports uh, approximately each day. Um, and this is really um, at this point associated with the transmission levels in, in the communities that are reporting. We're working with the health department. We actually just released a memo um, in the last few moments to uh, to the um, to schools. We're working to clarify some some questions about contact tracing and other other requirements um, as a result of our um, uh, of our um, strong and healthy start. We're hearing lots of challenges, but uh, we're also um, get, schools are doing um, some things that are a little bit more than required in terms of uh, the contact tracing. So we're we're working with the health department to get that sort of streamlined um, and clarify what the roles and expectations are as we continue to see these high case numbers. Um, we're anticipating that it's going to continue to be a busy couple of weeks. That's, that's a bit borne out since from our previous projection. Um, and and then we'll as we see um, as we get into later in the month, um, the vaccine we expect vaccination to bring case counts down and make. Uh, make the contact tracing and, and uh, outbreak uh, response um, more manageable. And the modeling, as I just sort of alluded to, still points that case counts will drop at the end of the month when Vermont's vaccination rate approaches 60%. It's currently around 50%. I don't have a lot of information, unfortunately, about the Janssen delay, as I'm sure you've seen. Um, the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has been delayed um, it's, it's looking like it will last around another week. Um, and uh, so the health department has canceled um, some vaccine appointments for the Johnson & Johnson. It is still the lowest number of, um, of, of vaccines of the three that we give. It, it, we, we have the lowest number of doses there. So um, and we're still seeing the Pfizer and Moderna um, vaccines um, increase, which is very good. Um, we are, uh, we actually just, uh, the governor just announced at the press conference and we just sent some information to schools. Very exciting news. Starting tomorrow at 10 a.m., uh, Vermonters age 16, 17, and 18 will be able to register uh, for vaccines. Um, they, the, the, there's a little bit of distinction here, so I'm, I'm actually going to pull up the email just to make sure I don't get anything wrong. Um, 16 and 17 year olds will be able to register for the Pfizer vaccine. That's the only vaccine for which there's an emergency use, use, use authorization, excuse me, um, for the folks in the 16 and 17 age, age group. Um, so folks will be able to register starting at 10 a.m. tomorrow on the state's TBRS system or make appointments through uh, pharmacies. They need uh, parent and guardian permission if they're minors. So um, for some folks, for example, going to Walgreens or kidney drugs, um, the parent and guardian must accompany the 16 or 17 year old to the appointment to provide consent. Folks registering through the state's registration system via the health department website or registering at CVS, um, the parent has to provide consent um, at the point of registration on the online system. Um, we're very excited about this uh, because hopefully it will allow some, um, some Vermont, Vermonters who are students, um, high school students to sign up um, uh, and get and get vaccine appointments as soon as possible. Um, certainly before the uh, before we get into the end of the year, which will only help with uh, keeping folks safe in school and allowing us to continue with more in-person instruction. And we're also very excited about this as as we get closer to um, the end of the year graduations, um, those sort of celebrations. So um, just a quick quick um, yeah of quick, course. quick quick uh, you said starting tomorrow. I thought it was actually starting Monday. Yes, so this is a change. So all Vermonters age 16 plus will be able to um, register starting um, uh, at, on Monday at 6 a.m. What has changed and was announced today is that only Vermonters between 16 and 18 will be able to register starting on Saturday. The idea is to allow them to get into the system, register for some appointments sooner rather than later um, to receive the Pfizer 
vaccine if they're 16 or 17. 18 year olds can receive both both Pfizer and Moderna um, with the idea that we can start to get some of our high school student populations vaccinated as soon as possible. So that is the new change, thus, thus the announcement. Appreciate that clarification, Representative Conlon, my apologies. Um, uh, so we're um, in the process of considering and planning um, for ongoing surveillance testing, uh, both for unvaccinated staff and um, in the future for students um, in the spring, into the summer and into the fall of next year. Um, I don't have details on how this how this looks yet because we're still trying to put the program together, but, um, but we're hoping to use this as, as part of our ongoing protective measures for schools. Um, I'll go over a couple of additional thoughts about what we might be looking at as we get into the summer and fall in a few, in a few moments. Um, just turning briefly uh, to guidance, um, the Vermont Forward Plan, which the governor announced last week, lays out our trajectory to the 4th of July. Um, we are seeing a couple of other states move more quickly. Um, New Hampshire is saying they'll be removing all restrictions, including um, uh, a, the mask mandate prior to Memorial Day. Um, the governor has extended his state of emergency um, as well. Um, and at this point, we're not sure how long this will last, whether or not it will still be in the place in the fall. Um, but uh, but he's, he does this on a 30-day rolling basis as, as, need, as the need requires. Um, uh, just so in terms of the fall, um, we, we're hopeful. It's, it's way too soon to say what exactly the fall will be like. We are getting questions about it. Um, but we are hopeful that we'll get back to in-person instruction um, with uh, sort of yet to be determined safety precautions in place. These could, example, uh, for example, include masking, masking or the surveillance testing I just referenced. Um, and, and of course, schools will be working on education recovery and you're gonna get um, a more thorough briefing from Deputy Secretary Boucher on that. Um, so, so there probably will be some level of, of precautions on the what, what we think of internally in our response as the, the COVID response. So ongoing safety, safety and health precautions but really an a, a increased focus on the education recovery activities. Um, um, the last thing um, is that we're not sure about what the vaccine requirements will be. You may have seen some national reporting on this um, in terms of whether or not the emergency use author, author, that's the second time I've done that today. The emergency use authorizations um, will uh, be extended to younger, um, younger folks. Um, they may go down as even even as low as 12 in, in the near future, but we don't have any information about what although that might happen. But um, it could uh, that could, something like that could happen in time for the fall, and so that would be a, something that we could take into consideration um, when we're when we're doing fall planning. I will just note uh, I did I did go over this fairly thoroughly last week, I believe, um, but I will note that our current safety and health guidance is in effect until the end of the school year. We are working on safety and health guidance for summer programs, um, including programs for summer nutrition. We do a lot of summer nutrition activities in the, in the, um, in the summer. Um, and, then, and then once we get through into that and have a better idea of what the fall is gonna look like, that's when we will be um, determining what, what, what is necessary for the fall. Representative that James. concludes my uh, formal update. Thank you, Representative James, you had a question? Yeah. Um, Ted, did you see when the, what's the date now for the state of emergency? So the governor extended it. I, I honestly, I, my notes just say that he extended it for 30 days. Um, I would have to look, I can try and do that in real time very quickly, but he extended it for 30 days from this date. He usually extends it um, right around the time it's about to expire. So I would assume that okay. it's extended into the middle of May, but I'm going to just very quickly check his website because usually they update fairly. Thank you. And if, you, if not, I can find it there too. So he, on well, they have not updated their website, but on March 15th, he extended it to April 15th. And he announced this morning that he's extended it until, um, until May 15th for 30 days. So my assumption is that it would go until until May 15th. And then at that point, we'll, there'll be a decision about whether it will be extended further. Any questions? Representative Brown. Oh, thank you so much. 
Um, I had, I just wanted to make sure I wrote, I made my notes correctly. So starting, you said starting tomorrow, students 16 to 18 are able to register. Is there a particular go live time, you know, 10 o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning? It's, it's 10 a.m. I will make sure that I actually forward this email to Jesse and to, um, and to represent uh, to chair Webb. Um, to distribute to folks because I know m many folks may want to communicate that to uh, to, to your uh, your stakeholder group. So I will forward along the email that we put out this afternoon. If um, you could just keep it quiet until ten ten on Saturday, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions then for Ted Fisher? Thank you. Just to, to keep you abreast of what uh, your House Education Committee is doing, um, we passed out S16, excuse me, S16. That will be on notice on Tuesday and will go to appropriations. That's the one that's marked in exclusionary discipline that we're, we're going to be changing the title of that as well. Um, S115, that has one of the issues that we just talked about. We're hoping to have that, the current plan is to have that ready to pass out to vote on Tuesday. So we'll just need that last little bit of information, I think, related to wellness. Um, and we're also, with that last other piece of information on the e-finance group. Uh, so, have, have, excuse me, Representative Conlon, has that, has, um, has uh, CFO seen that language? Uh, no. Okay. No, I can I can pass it by him. Okay. Um, I, I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so our anticipation is to pass pass the that bill out on uh, Tuesday, and then we will be working on reporting those bills and taking up S thirteen in earnest. Um. The S114, S13 being waiting, S114 is a literacy bill that's up in um, uh, House appropriations at the moment. Uh, there's some, we're working on the communication between House and Senate. The House bill uh, used the 3 million more broadly and strategically at the agency, giving more discretion to the agency. The Senate wants to put the 3 million into a grant program. So we're trying to work on those issues to, to iron those out. I am in receipt of a memo from um, the commission, the secretary French that I will share momentarily with the committee, at least the, the, the detail, not the actual you know, memo, but at least the, the detail. Um, and I'm assuming we're going to, uh, that, that the secretary will be able to get back to me on Monday so that we may uh, get something that, that is ready to, to move, because I, I think there's a great desire to get things moving on, on literacy. I, I know that you, the agency is building up for this anyway, I would assume you're, you're, you're working. Knowing he, this. Yeah. he indicated to me he'll be in touch with you and yes. that he's working on something for you. Great. Um, and then I think uh, we have, have we gotten a specific response? I can't remember. The secretary was in on 13, right? Last week, or the other day. He, he, he spoke with us for just a minute and before uh, Professor Colby. So That's we'll correct. Be, That's yeah. We'll be working on that as well. Uh, Representative Austin. Yeah, just, um, I think I had asked the last time you were in, if you could give us an update on summer school and kind of addressing loss of learning, if, how that's moving along. Absolutely. Um, Secretary, uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher was scheduled to cover that with you this morning. And I, and I know we're trying to get that rescheduled for next week. I do believe she'd sent along a couple of links um, to the to the committee uh, that you may be able to review prior to her coming in. Right, we'll appreciate that. Um, anything else? Okay, I'm just going to share some of the notes then I I, I have about possible um, 
updates to how we might want to look at the uh, at S114. We'd love to have you stay if you'd like, um, but understand that you. I, I unfortunately have to depart at um at uh at two, but I, I'd be happy to hang out until then. I okay. hope you all have a absolutely wonderful weekend. Okay, thank you, Jesse. Um, could you pull up the, the the document that I sent to you? One of the challenges I think that we all felt, and it was certainly evident when I went up to talk to the appropriations committee about our bill, that some of the information was they just felt was a little loose. Um, and that was had to do with the, uh, they were struggling with the language in the work group um, that uh, said the purpose of technical support for supervisory unions under this section, um, of this act uh, and the contractor report uh, of this act, that they'll be carrying out duties to address learning loss and improve literacy outcomes. Oh, sorry, wrong area. I can hang in for a minute. I'm going to, yeah. They, we said that the shall retain the contractor to provide technical assistance to SUs, and that would be things like recommending for how to use federal funds, evidence based practices, professional development, policies, procedures, educational leadership. And I ended up contacting um, Secretary French to say if there's $3 million how would you want to use it? And um, this is the information that I got back that I thought was of interest and we may want to consider incorporating into our bill. Um, I am also considering that we would want to make language to make it such that uh, grants could be available out of the 3 million to allow uh, some of the money to be used for grants. Um, but in, in our conversations, we felt that using all of it probably uh, wasn't going to produce the, the results that, that we had hoped for. So I don't know if you can see this on the send the email, but um, the goal here from these ideas is basically to create a more strategic uh, process that would maximize the use of one-time federal COVID dollars to improve literacy, advance district capacity on implementing 173 block grants that are coming up, and to strengthen instructional systems uh, statewide. Um, so this possibility that I'm gonna try to work on some language on that, you feel free to take a look at that document. The secretary also indicated that he would try to find a way to find some language that might um, be able to get to what what uh, both of us want, all wanting the same thing, which is to make progress on, on literacy. Um, I think you, you can probably take that down. Representative Austin? Yes, where is that document? I can't. Where's um, could you just email it, perhaps, to everybody? I just, I can't. Is it posted? I, I, I just, no, it's just my notes. She had emailed it to us, um, Representative Austin. It's in your legislative email. I don't think I got it. It was on Tuesday the 13th? No, it's today. Oh, it was today. Oh. So it was in the last hour. Oh. I don't have it. I think that may have just been to leadership, but I'm it forwarding it just now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you could just send it to everybody, just to get an idea of... of the way that, that we had considered looking at it was um, how do we use the set aside state funds to think of a, a broader perspective versus sending money to the districts that have a lot of money, yep. perhaps not precluding that based on the testimony that we had from the agency and from the, the uh, education advocates. So I'll be working on that over the weekend and hopefully we'll have that pulled together on Monday. Um, so that I, we can, I can take it up to um, appropriations and to you. And I don't have anything else. Is anybody else? Then, can, I, can I just share one thing? Sure. 
I, I just felt like I was blindsided a bit on Tuesday when we were just about to take a vote on S one one five, and I'm not. I, I guess I, that's how it happens, but it was. It's just concerning to me. I, you know, I you spend months. I mean, kind of looking at the language and looking at the wording and looking at the intent and looking at the outcomes, and you know, to, I. And I, I, I guess I'm wondering, is that kind of normal? I mean, to kind of develop policy in 12 minutes? Others want to respond who've been here for a while? I guess I'm a little unclear. You just said we spent months working on the language and everything. At a certain point, we do have to fish or cut bait with it. But I, I felt like the AOE came in and changed everything, you know, uh, not, not the intent so much, but at least the funding. Um, Are you talking about 115? Yes. The miscellaneous ed bill? No, no, I'm sorry, the uh, literacy bill. Literacy bill. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so I think the answer to that would be yes, that does happen, um, but especially at a time when you're trying yeah. to find a path forward between two houses with two different visions yeah. and an agency that's ultimately responsible yeah. And so, yeah, it can't happen because if one path is clearly blocked, then sometimes you got to be able to pivot quickly to another path that might work better. Okay. Thank you for letting me know that because I was, sure. I couldn't figure that out at all. No, it's, you know, it's, it's not pretty sometimes. And time is of the essence most of the time. The, the time pressure makes it a bit more difficult to do the work being remote adds a, a whole other factor. Our ability to pull a few people together, the secretary's walking through, we're not trying to schedule an appointment with them. Um, you can grab ledge council quickly, you can run down to ledge council's office. Um, it, it's, the, the conditions are, are really, really very difficult, I would say. And it, it was particularly when, when there's a time crunch and there's a real desire to get something moved quickly and it's, uh, and the conditions are so complicated and the funding is so different. Yeah. I just thought we were ready to vote on it. I thought the whole committee was on board. You know, we would, you know, I certainly felt like I, there was nothing left on the table for me. And then it wasn't what I was planning on voting on. So it, it's just process, just understanding the process and how things work and it was just really, I, I really felt blindsided by it. I was like, kind of couldn't figure out what was going on. Yeah, I think you were blindsided. Um, yes, Representative Harrison. General question, most all the work we've done and, and it's been handed over from the Senate has date specifics on it. What happens to these bills if they linger in, in, into January of next year? What happens uh, to all the dates? Um, sometimes, so sometimes you, you, you'll, so let's say uh, we sent what, let's say we sent our construction bill over with certain dates on it. And some of those dates you can see aren't gonna happen before they pass it back, they would be changing those dates. Um, or those would need to change to a, to a okay. that That's very common. Okay, that answers my question. And there's also the possibility that things are sent over from the other body and they stay on the wall, um, or they are, you know, brought out at the last minute. There's, a, it's complicated. And this year will be difficult, but next year, when we're in the end of the biennium, can be also be difficult. Um, Representative Bright, James. Yeah. Um, so I have two uh, non-related thoughts. So on the, um, I'm just trying to figure out what I need to get done over the weekend. On the social work thing, we're waiting to hear from AOE, right? It's, yes. Okay. Um, feel free to dog that. I will. From um, Deputy Secretary Boucher, right? Boucher, right. Yep. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to say in response to Rep. Austin um, is that I, to me, what feels very unique about this time frame, and I. I mean, I've seen, we've, we've all seen bills change on a dime under other circumstances too, but I think what's very different this time is this, you know, influx of federal funding um, with changing guidelines and changing dates. And, you know, everybody's in the 
process of trying to develop their recovery plans and, and figure out, you know, so that one didn't, uh, you know, I, I guess I, that one didn't shock me because I, I feel like we're sort of learning more every day about ESSER and um, ARPA and how these funds can be used and, and how the schools are going to be, you know, working on their plans. And anyway, just, yeah. I think what, what helped me was the relationship we've developed, at least I feel from my perspective, with the AOE, because I feel like I, I absolutely feel that they will they know our intent and they will do their best to carry it out. And so that relationship building, I think, was really helpful to have in place. Um, so that's all. I think if you look at literacy, when we first started working on that last year, we were totally working on a program that I think we did a beautiful job um, giving school districts something that they definitely wanted, which was money. They've got money now and nobody, you know, nobody's telling, nobody can tell them how they have to do it, except they have to follow the federal guidelines. So we don't, we don't have anything to, to control that in that way. Yeah. Um, well, they've got four, over $400 million um, and we can't, we can't interfere with them on that. Either can the agency yeah. by the by the federal law. Representative Hooper. Madam Chair, so I'm correct in understanding, I hope, uh, that on Tuesday we'll vote on the miscellaneous ed bill. Yes. That's so right. I'm not looking to change it before then, but I'm curious to know if we feel confident that we settled on the on my section the ask that the uh, that Amanda and company uh, made? Um, I, I think we don't have that language yet. I think we've asked for that language. Um, I wonder, since you're doing that section, if it might be helpful if you reached out to uh, say Tammy Colby and said, hey, if we were to be asking for some help, not probably not from you, <laughs> but from an expert to advise um, the agency and the work group mm -hmm. on implementing you know, on on developing standards that were sensitive to ethnic and social groups. Um, what do you think that would cost? <laughs> okay, so we because right now we have a number of, of fifty thousand. You could also call um, Amanda. Garces yes. and ask her how she came up with the 500, the 50,000. I thought she said 60, but yeah, okay. Whatever the button amount that she came up, ask her how she came up with that amount. That I will. would be helpful. Sure. I'd like, I'd like to, if we're going to come up with a number that we've based it on something besides we just found it on a piece of paper. Yeah, because I, I would hate to get attacked from both sides. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it would be it would be good to to verify where that number comes from, and and then then you'd have to defend it in the committee, and then defend it in uh, appropriations. Looking forward to it. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be great. So I've got Brown on sections on um, libraries and cultural liaison. I've got Austin on um, uh, wellness and menstrual products. I've got. Um, Cooper on ethnic studies. I've got James on what's 14? No, I don't have you on anything, right? You demoted me. I demoted you. No, I'm keeping you focused on the other bill. You've got a whole bill. I know. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen with that. It's sitting there. It's because of your varsity. And um, <laughs> Conlon, you're going to do e finance, and Toof's going to do the state board. Right? Yeah, excellent. So, all right, good work committee. I appreciate your understanding the complexity of the task before, before us and the quality of, of work and, and comments that come from members. And with that- okay, do, we, yeah. do we have a, just a quick question. Do we have anything big on the docket besides 13? That would be it, unless okay. S100 comes over. Yes, yes, right. But I, I don't know what we're gonna do with S100 at the moment. Um, I don't know, we'll have to see. Okay. If it okay. comes to us, I don't know. I think that's it. I think it's that and whatever happens with what they do with our bills. Right. 
So I'm assuming that we'll get something back on construction. I know that they're working on that. I'm not sure where we are on, on um, community schools. Representative James, you're more than welcome to reach out to your senator. I will be reaching out to him because I, you know, they took testimony and then I, I'm not sure that they've done much more. I've, I've texted yeah. them once, but I didn't want to pester. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what you know. What do you know? Nothing. <laughs> okay. I know nothing. <laughs> Can we ask Representative Beck and uh, Professor Colby to come back again at some point? We're going to include um, Representative Beck in the room. Um, we're going to uh, start looking at some of the recommendations on 13 and Representative Conlon, you're, tag your it on that bill. Um, we did have one request that I thought was really an important one, and it came from the state, the, the school boards, at, which in this work group to include an analysis to determine the potential impact of waiting factors, mis, uh, maintenance of effort, <laughs> and um, uh, census-based funding models upon each other. So I think that that's an important one. And the maintenance of effort, um, for those who aren't sure what that is, the, the maintenance of effort is whatever you spent on special education last year, you can't, uh, you can't supplant with other funds. You have to, you can't, you, no, that's not, I'm not explaining that right. Uh, you have to, you have to be consistent in the amount of, of state and local funds that you're using and you can't all of a sudden cut for some reason, unless you can say, well, that teacher retired and we replaced her with, with someone who was much less expensive. We had two children that cost $200,000 a year moved. So those are the reasons you can change it, but you can't just decide, you can't just do that without paying a penalty. Um, so as we move to the census-based funding, um, where uh, some districts, it, it's, it's, Going to be, it's going to be interesting and we don't have the floor settled and that's why we're really hoping to use some of these federal funds to, in terms of literacy, set up the playing field that Act 173 was recommending that we, do, we, we implement. Okay, great. thank you. It is, it is such an interesting concept in that Vermont has been identified as being really one of the highest spending states on special ed, but you can't really cut your special ed spending because it violates the federal rules about maintenance of effort, um, unless you can show causal reasons, as Kate just explained. So you're in this sort of feedback loop where you say, well, we would really like to tackle this, but we can't because we could be run afoul of uh, federal rules. And if, if we start to be able to use our special ed dollars differently, like to get regular you know, classroom teachers, um, trained in certain kinds of instruction that it's going to help some of our students who are struggling, we can use special ed dollars for that. Or excuse me, we can use, we can use the reading instructor now, <laughs> whereas before we can't because they're not special ed certified. It's, it's really, it's crazy. And it's why we wanted to move to that. And all of this came up because our education spending is high goes back to that in 2014, I think. Okay. I think we're there. Who else?